Hello, everyone. Welcome back to today's podcast. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's podcast, I want to go over the differences between radical acceptance when it comes to mental health and radical acceptance when it comes to philosophy. This was inspired by a slew of comments that I had received or seen around where people, every time I reference radical acceptance, think I'm referencing mental health. And though I am honored that lots of people mistake my channel for a therapy channel or a mental health channel, I really am focused on philosophy, I'm focused on lifestyle, and I wanna share the tools that I learned throughout my life that improved my existing and existence, and I just wanna give them to you, and I hope that they help you, and if they don't, that's okay too. But I am not a therapy channel, I'm not a mental health channel in that way. I don't want to brand myself incorrectly, but I know people will mistake what I'm saying because you guys know we love psychology here, but I'm not a therapist, right? I'm just a person who loves philosophy, but because there's an overlap with philosophy and mental health, I thought today we'd talk about those slight differences and why the nuance is so important. Now, before we actually jump in, today I'm drinking my strawberry tea. This is my favorite one, you guys know. I get it at a local shop here in Croatia. It's just super delicious, hot or cold, but today we are drinking it warm. I also feel like the strawberry theme goes with like the pink I'm wearing today, so I thought that was pretty cute. Okay. <sighs> What I did in preparation for this podcast was I actually have a list of information to the left of me from Marshall Linehan to Tara Branch to Buddhism. And I want to go over the differences and how we ended up, well, we end up now in the modern time uh, sort of observing these tools that we've been given and why they get so misunderstood. Now, obviously, I'm speaking from my bubble experience. I could be wrong on your bubble experience, meaning your lifestyle, where you were born, your culture, your upbringing, your surroundings. They're going to be totally different than mine because we're all born in different parts of the planet, in different bodies, with different genders, with different belief systems. So I'm just speaking about the tools that I've gathered within my life. So very anecdotal. But the way that I separate the differences between philosophy, spiritual health, and therapy, mental health, is sort of the why we're using those particular tools. So I think there's like five parts of being a core or five parts of being a whole human being. That's what, these are the things that I came up with in my life to help me, okay? So I think you should know yourself financially, physically, spiritually, mentally, and who you are in the story, right? Know your trope. To know your trope is a very a sort of easy, hard thing to do depending on how much media you consume or books you read or characters you identify with. But that's like pretty simple, right? Who are you in the story? Watch a favorite TV show. Who do you sort of identify with? Who stands out to you as like a relatable character? And then moving on, let's say you go to financial health. Okay, well, financial health is just a matter of survival. So sort of appealing to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Financial health is about making sure you've got the basics down because we live in a world where the construct of money is a reality. So we have to be able to understand that game that people are playing. Then you move on to something like uh, physical health. Obviously your body, this vessel you're born into is holding your consciousness, what I call like the soul or the consciousness interchangeably. is sort of this thing that makes you, you. And I do separate the concept of a consciousness or a soul from your brain, which I think operates more in the mental health realm. So if you go to mental health as another point of being a whole human being, Mental health is sort of how your brain works, the science behind your brain, your understanding of your past trauma, current trauma, the idea of healing, the damage the body holds, sort of um, coinciding with sort of like the body keeps the score or Marsha Linehan's work for DBT. Since obviously I am a borderline personality disorder, I labeled person, like I got diagnosed with that in 2017. And because I'm in basically remission or maintenance mode, I'm a person that says my mental health was improved by Marshall Linehan's DBT, which also uses radical acceptance, but without the radical acceptance in a philosophy way. So that's that spiritual philosophy relationship you're having with the consciousness. I think therapy without philosophy is kind of meaningless because what the therapy does is it helps you understand your brain and what the philosophy does is it helps you understand the consciousness, your soul, and who you are, like the core of who you are. So there's a video on YouTube actually from Marsha Linehan. I've got it here right now. It's from Borderline Notes, the user on YouTube. I will play a little bit of a clip so you guys can see it, but even Marsha in curating DBT and creating this thing that helped her as a borderline personality disorder person, she had to go and meditate 
and go do a program of radical acceptance and had to do a spiritual journey to sort of convert that language into a mental health prescription, if you will. I've been transformed by the very therapy that I developed because once I realized that I had to teach the clients acceptance, I realized at that very same moment in my own personal life, I had somehow lost my ability to accept and that I was going to have to learn it myself. What I found out when I went to the first Buddhist monastery was within days I knew that I had found exactly what my clients needed. Acceptance was exactly what they needed, but that they had a way of teaching it that I could translate. My problem was I tried to take it stock and barrel to my clients. At Chasta Abbey, the basic message was all the time to try to radically accept everything and to let go of desires and what you want. So we got jobs every single morning. And so it was the idea of practicing letting go of wanting a particular job. If you were sweeping, they would tell you when the bell rang for work to stop, they would tell you stop in the middle because finishing is just your own thing. You're trying to do something you want to do, just let go. It was the first environment I'd ever been in. It was completely non-sexist. I thought I'd die and go to heaven. I'm not kidding. It was so unbelievable. Men and women would get the same jobs. There was no real distinction. I mean, admittedly, it may not have been helpful if I hadn't just completely thrown myself into it. But since I decided ahead of time that I had to learn this, my only option was just to do everything I was told. You know, just throw myself in. And you'd you know, I was a student, so there were eight of us. We did everything together. It was really the practice of letting go of having to have what you wanted. So DBT is a form of therapy that can be very helpful for lots of people, not just people with borderline. And though it practices radical acceptance, it's focused on a very particular part because it's therapy, right? Philosophy is different. When Marshall Linhan went and spent time with that group of eight people and practiced radical acceptance, she wasn't doing therapy. She was doing spiritual, you can call it spirituality, uh, you can call it explaining or having a relationship with the metaphysical, you could say it's a religion, you could say it's philosophy. You could use all the woo woo words you would like, but it's not therapy. So when you go into a DBT, session with your therapist, you are focusing on trauma. You are focusing on yourself. You're focusing on your past. You're focusing on why things happened and how it's impacting the body. It's a very different experience than going to a retreat center, speaking or not speaking, but spending time with a group of people who are learning to let go of the attachment that they have curated and therefore the suffering they feel in life. Given that my spiritual part of myself is the core of myself, more central than anything else about me, having that understood was an amazing experience. It was the practice of radical acceptance every moment. That can, will transform you. I don't have the slightest doubt. It would transform everyone. But it has to be a regular practice. And radical acceptance doesn't mean you don't try to change things because you only have to radically accept the moment that you're in, but you can try to change the next moment. You can't change anything if you don't accept it because if you don't accept it, you'll change, try to change something else that you think is reality. So radical acceptance is simply the radical acceptance that reality is what it is. And if you want to change it, then you work on changing it, which is perfectly legitimate also. But I think it's hard to change something if you don't accept it in the first place. Now. From PBS.org, they talk about the Four Noble Truths in relation to Buddhism. The Four Noble Truths, this is, I'm going to read this for you. It says, the Four Noble Truths comprise the essence of Buddha's teachings, though they leave much left unexplained. They are the truth of, su of suffering, the truth of the cause of suffering, the truth of the end of suffering, and the truth of the path that leads to the end of suffering. Okay, more simply put, suffering exists it has a cause, it has an end, and it has the cause to bring about its end. Now, just as a reference point, right, we're talking about um, historians estimate that the founder of Buddhism lived from 566 to 480 BC, question mark, right? We're thinking about this very specific old ancient concept of radical acceptance, 
facing the sacrifice and suffering of life. And we're trying to adapt it to this very 2024 modern world. So when people look at my content and they think, oh, Brittany's did DBT and Brittany knows it helped her so much. And now she's like an extremist who thinks radical acceptance is like this magical thing. Radical acceptance for therapy was very helpful. It helped me understand my brain and my DNA and my predispositions and my gen- everything about genetics and like so much went into understanding myself in a therapeutic sense, mental health, right? But it was nothing without philosophy. It was nothing without spiritualism. It was nothing without the belief or knowledge that we know very little and have yet to discover a lot of what is about the world. And a lot of that was a was a practicing of radical acceptance through a spiritual lens. So maybe Buddhism, maybe other uh, concepts around the metaphysics. We're just letting go of the attachment we have to knowing. We're letting go of the attachment we have to suffering. We're letting go of the attachment we have that that like that baggage, the baggage we're carrying on our shoulders. We don't have to carry it. We just carry it because we're we're sort of without the tools to know how to put it down. And so therapy can teach you how to put down the baggage of your trauma and Buddhism or spirituality can help you put down the baggage of greater questions in relation to the universe. So I feel like therapy helps you with you, the existing, and philosophy helps you with you in relation to the universe, everything outside of yourself, existence, the bigger picture in so many ways. Because I, again, I think therapy is so, so, so helpful, but I really do think it lacks sort of the why. So therapy explains why things happen to you. They, it doesn't always help you figure out your meaning crisis, as Ravaki would say. It doesn't help you figure out your why. Why do you do things? Why do you want to do things outside of your mental health? Because remember, the reason I didn't become a therapist was I felt like a cage, like a trap. It felt like if I became a therapist, I would be beholden to a board. I wouldn't, I would have a license I would have to worry about. I wouldn't be able to explore the world and share my ideas in the way that I wanted to. The reason I did philosophy was because it gave me the most freedom. Because philosophy is about figuring out the mysteries of the unexplained in relation to wisdom and knowledge. It's about the consciousness and the self. It's about so much, but it has little to no boundary as long as you don't identify so strongly with a label that you stop yourself from seeking more information. So many people will just become obsessed with like Ayn Rand, which I understand. I've read Rand. I get it. But she's so limiting because, again, if you start, you know, identifying yourself as an objectivist, you're sort of limiting yourself to identify with anything else. If you say you are a Stoic and you want to, you want to practice Stoicism and you've never read anything from the Stoics or you don't even understand what it is, and they have their own form of radical acceptance as well, by the way, you know, every, every form of philosophy sort of has its own branch of radical acceptance. Sometimes they call it different things. Sometimes it's the same thing. But we're all trying to figure out how to find peace, how to find wisdom, how to curate knowledge, how to examine that knowledge, what relationship to have with that knowledge. Some people feel like knowledge takes you um, sort of to the most grounded. And some people think knowledge takes you to some of the most metaphysical. And so that journey is what I'm open to. I'm open to any of those things. So much of the relationship that we're having with this is also going to come to head with the bubble. So look at me. I'm a YouTuber. I'm just a normal freaking person who's picked up tools along the way and literally gotten better, literally went from toxic to healthy, literally went from childhood trauma to functional adult, literally went from just toxic relationships to good, healthy marriage. I went from bad relationships with my parents to great relationships with my parents. It was just, I have done so many amazing things to myself because things I never thought I would accomplish, things that to 15-year-old Brittany are just like, whoa, I can't believe we did this. And We stopped wanting to unalive ourselves. We stopped being depressed. We stopped self-harming. We stopped so many habits that we had formed from eight years old to 30 years old. I, for most of my life, have been suffering in a way that was unnecessary, but also necessary because it was a part of my journey. So I couldn't have come to this Brittany now without without that journey and suffering, but all the, the suffering was also something that was a lesson to like go of not to not to hold on to so 
This from PBS keeps going the four noble truths. The notion of suffering is not intended to convey a negative worldview, but rather a pragmatic perspective that deals with the world as it is and attempts to rectify it. The concept of pleasure is not denied, but acknowledged as fleeting. Pursuit of pleasure can only continue what is ultimately an unquestionable thirst. The same logic belies on understanding of happiness. In the end, only aging, sickness, and death are certain and unavoidable. So we have people in the media, we have people, um, I forget his name, but there's a gentleman who's spending millions of dollars trying to fight death, aging. Some people have a belief that aging is the disease and that we could live much longer lives. Some people who follow the Christian religion believe Moses lived like 800 years or that people who are in the Old Testament lived many, many years longer than we do now until God decided to limit their life on earth. All of these ideas we create, I think, come from a hope that we hold on to and that hope comes from a place. I would say that philosophy would want you and encourage you to figure out where that place is coming from. Where does that desire come from? Where's that hope coming from? I know for myself, I have a deep, deep hope uh, and a belief that human beings are good. And I think I believe that because I know that I'm good. And I would like to think that people are good in the same way, that ultimately we only do bad because we don't have the tools to do good, or we do bad because in that moment that we are experiencing suffering, we take on the burden that is so heavy and unnecessary. And until we can figure out how to remove it and live in the present, it's very difficult to to find that goodness within yourself. You almost start to believe you're not good, but the truth is, is I think we have goodness within us, right? And goodness doesn't necessarily mean a specific thing other than furthest away from harm, like harm reduction. You know, I say evil as a construct is sort of furthest away from joy, but evil as a concept is also a construct of our nightmares. This person is evil. This person is monstrous. This person is, this person is furthest from joy. Now, I also want to specify the differences between mental health, living in the present, and spiritual living in the present. I do think there's a specific difference. I think when you're living in the present in your mental health, you're saying that you are no longer your trauma. You are not living in your trauma. You are breaking generational curses. You are living as the person you are now, unharmed, away from danger, living your good life. You're not going to carry that trauma into the present. And then spiritual in the present, I think, means radically in the present, like so in the present that you can see a blade of grass breathing. So in the present that you realize like, oh my gosh, I'm like all of these atoms moving around or so in the present, you recognize sort of like the beauty of everything around you because it is so surreal that we're even alive, that we're even here, that I'm even making this video, that you're even consuming this content, but living in the present, mental health is usually about your trauma or the things that have hurt you. Radical acceptance, living in the present philosophy is so much bigger than you. It is, in my mind, supposed to be or is the journey of so much bigger than you. It is why they say in religious communities, you want to have something bigger than you and that bigger than you is God. And maybe that's true. I don't quite believe in a God. So for me, the bigger than me is the universe. The fact that I am here, the fact that we live on a floating rock, the fact that I think everything is alive in a living organism, the fact that I think we're evolved animals over time, the fact that we're a part of this living organism, that we are not sort of separate from the animal, that we are the animal, we're just a different type of animal. You know, so much of it is about radically accepting how little I know, how much there is still to find out, how I will die, not knowing 99.9% .9 of it. So much about life is a radical acceptance of how short it is, how special it is, and how in control I am of it by letting go of the attachment that I was in control of it. When people on my level system of introspection, the levels, if you guys don't know, I came up with my own system, links down below for that video. It's a very good video. But a two would sort of let go of the attachment of control and probably give it to something like a god. And I think a five would let go of the attachment of control, right? By radically accepting they only have power over what they do and then can evoke change. Marshall Linehan talks about this, which I think is really important. L you know, radical acceptance 
of letting go of the attachment of control doesn't also mean you can't change things. I actually think uh, Robert Spl not Pl Splonsky, Spl I can't remember how to say his name. He also talks about this too, how he believes in determinism, right? He just wrote that book, Determined, and he talks about how we're biological entities and creatures and we are our biology and we have no free will, but that doesn't mean we can't make change or choice. And that's a really hard idea to sort of contend with. How are we in one way, this free will, creature who has free will, and in another way, this, this creature that is a biological entity and has no free will. And a big part of it is radically accepting that everything is a tiny contradiction in life, that two things can be true at once. But what are those two things true? Or how are those th two things true? So I separate it, as you guys know, in the macro and micro. And I would say on the micro, you can evoke free will and make a different decision than what your animal brain wants you to do. And then you could say on the macro, you don't exist because if you zoom out like can you even see yourself on this little planet or in this um, galaxy itself? But then you could say more with the determinist view that you're a biological creature and you're doing what you're doing, what you're doing. And no matter what you do, you are nature. So you are doing what you're supposed to be doing. And it isn't about free will. It's just about doing what seems natural to your biological uh, makeup, which I think also makes sense. I think all of it kind of makes sense. And I think that's what's so special about life is that there is some sort of theory out there. I think it's Baha'i or another belief system I can't remember that sort of believes like all of the gods are true or all of the religions are somewhat true or all of the theories could be true. I think it's a little bit of everything. It's probably more or less objective. But even seeking out objective in the micro is different than seeking out objective in the macro. So when I say I'm interested in objective truth, I'm interested in that truth that exists outside of our perception, which we might, I think, can't set it, not, we might not have access to it. Therefore, we're having a subjective experience. It's like, oh my gosh, all of these people who have come before us have already had these conversations a thousand times. And now we're just continuing the conversation in the modern world. But we're, we're only somewhat closer to figuring it out. Science is giving us a great tool to figure out more, right? But at the same time, even science is created by these humans that are flawed and these humans that are biological creatures and these humans that are animals evolved over time. And so even their data is going to be flawed because we have bias and prejudice and a lack of knowledge and an ego that tells us we're right. And so again, when you're practicing radical acceptance, it's letting go of that idea that you had control in the first place while acknowledging you can still make change, which is evoked through your free will, which is a perception you're having with your sense of control. So when we're having these conversations, we're having a lot of the same and a lot of a different conversation all wrapped into one conversation. So of course, if somebody watches my content and doesn't have all that background knowledge and doesn't understand all of those things, they're just going to see somebody who's sort of, oh, she must have gotten this information just from therapy or just from this book, or she must have read one thing or done one drug. And then, oh my gosh, she's, there are so many people doing an incredible book incredible amount of research about enlightenment, about introspection, about our brain, biology, about everything that is us. And it's just not the most popular thing on the internet, but it does exist and it's incredibly interesting. And if you're interested in it, just start reading. There's no place to start. There's only a place to go. And it's it's endless, right? So uh, this article that continues going, it says the four noble truths are a contingency plan for dealing with the suffering humanity faces, suffering of a physical kind or of a mental nature. So you could argue that before formalized therapy as we know it today, the Buddhists and people before us, ancient cultures were already doing this. I get asked all the time, do you think ancient civilizations were introspective? Yes. Why wouldn't they be? They don't necessarily, not everybody, of course. But of course, they have nature itself to contend with. We think the modern era is the time when people were introspective. No. Introspection is a tool all of us have access to, right? Unless you're in a coma. So of course, I think that people in ancient civilization had access to introspection. We see it in the Buddha. We see it in other people. We see it throughout history or what we have as documented history. So the idea that past ancient civilizations, things before our conception of time, so things that were so far from us, from this current modern day, right? The idea that they weren't already studying this is such an 
arrogance of the modern world. It goes on to say, the first truth identifies the presence of suffering. The second truth, on the other hand, seeks to determine the cause of suffering. The boot In Buddhism, desire and ignorance lie at the root of suffering. Desire and ignorance lie at the root of suffering, which is why I think as I became more introspective, I suffered less. Of course I did. I was having a relationship with myself that was profound. And then on top of that, I moved that relationship to the universe and I was having an even more oh my god like oh like not just Britney as a Britney related to her family or her friends or her YouTube channel but Britney in relation to the universe well who is Britney does she even exist in relation to the universe does my suffering even exist okay so then it says by desire Buddhists refer to craving pleasure material goods and immortality all of which are wants that can never be satisfied. This is also true in Christianity, right? Desire, um, uh, pleasure, material goods. That's why, you know, they always talk about the rich man getting into heaven, uh, hedonism, materialism as a negative, because it's just, your stuff is going to be someone else's stuff in about a hundred years, guys. You're going to die. Your life will cease to exist in the way that you know it. So to hold on to these things when you can't take them with you, it's just the root of suffering, isn't it? Let it go. If you can, practice letting it go. That doesn't mean you can't change your life for the better. That doesn't mean you can't enjoy nice things. It doesn't mean you don't deserve nice things. It doesn't mean any of those things. It's just asking you to recontextualize what you think is a nice thing in the first place. It's asking you, is this the nice thing that you really should be seeking? That's really the question, right? It says, as a result, desiring them can only bring suffering. Ignorance and comparison relates to not seeing the world as it actually is. Without the capacity for mental con concentration and insight, Buddhism explains one's mind is left undeveloped, unable to grasp the true nature of things. Vices such as greed, envy, hatred, and anger derive from this ignorance. Absolutely. You know, sometimes I'll see comments about myself on the internet, and sometimes I do engage. Sometimes I become uh, a two <laughs> and I engage in the bubbles and then I realize like this makes so much sense for where they're coming from. Of course, they're going to see me and they're going to think, who is this girl? She thinks she's enlightened. I don't think I'm enlightened. But of course, you would think I think that because your only relationship with introspection and what I describe as a five could be related to this word enlightenment, which by the way, I do think is a catch 22. Because to seek out enlightenment and to think it's like the end all be all is to seek out the Bugatti that can't follow you into the afterlife. What good is enlightenment if it drives you crazy? What good is enlightenment if it doesn't bring you peace and joy? What good is enlightenment if you treat it like money? Kind of contradictory to the idea of it, right? So, you know, the catch 22 sort of of seeking enlightenment is you have to let go of the desire to seek enlightenment. And then what is enlightenment? It's a construct created from us because we don't have access to the objective. We only have access to our perception. And so created this word called, you know, enlightenment. And now we have an attachment to it. And what does it mean? We've used it in many different ways. We have a relationship with it in many different ways, from a historical sense to a personal sense to a magical sense. People um, do calls with me or they'll write me or they'll come on the Discord and they'll say, how do I get enlightenment? You know, I just want this magical answer that's going to change and transform my life overnight. I wish. I wish. I am a student. You're a student. We're all going to be students for the rest of our life. And that's a good thing, right? One, we'll never get bored. And two, it means that that itself is the answer. That we are nothing but students of life. And that's kind of exciting and freeing. And it allows you to remove that burden of having to know. All I know is that I know nothing. As one man once said. The third noble truth, it continues to say, the truth of the end of suffering has a dual meaning, suggesting either the end of suffering in this life on earth or in a spiritual life through achieving nirvana. When one has achieved nirvana, which is a transcendent state free from suffering in our worldly cycle of birth and rebirth, spiritual enlightenment has been reached. The fourth noble truth charts the method of attaining the end of suffering known to Buddhists as the noble eightfold path. The step of the noble eightfold path are right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, 
right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Moreover, there are three themes in which the path is divided. A good moral conduct, understanding, thought, speech, meditation and mental development, action, livelihood, effort, and wisdom or insight, mindfulness, and concentration. You know, I will tell you from my own perspective, and I'm just a student, and I am not claiming to like have the end-all be-all understanding of anything. When I practice living in the present in a physical uh, or a philosophy metaphysic sense, it does feel like I'm ending my suffering because I I almost become like a ball of energy. It's almost like going back to the true root of a human. Like if the true root of us in the scientific sense is atoms, and then the true root sense of us in spirituality is energy, and the true root sense of us is just being, then the best form of meditation in my mind is going to be practicing just being. So it isn't just thinking or breathing or recognizing that this is my body. It's a practice of just being sort of like becoming um, a drop of water that instead of identifying itself as the drop of water is now just a part of the ocean. And it's hard to identify a single drop of water when you throw it into the ocean. And that's how I feel about myself. I practice a meditation uh, of sort of letting go of seeing myself as in a single drop of water. And I only, I only, I lose myself sort of in the ocean And that's sort of that practice of the micro versus the macro. So on the micro, I'm the single little dot of water. And on the macro, like, who am I really? You can't even see me. Do I even exist? And that's the idea. So we know we exist. But when you zoom out into the universe, into space, I mean, what is Earth but a floating rock? And that's the question we have to ask ourselves when we're having these conversations. This isn't therapy. This is philosophy. Therapy is so wonderful. And radical acceptance through DBT or other forms of therapy are great. You see how everything I just talked about is in therapy? It's philosophy. So don't forget that if you're going to watch my content, I'm giving you tools that I can't give you if you are looking for therapy. I'm not a therapist. But I am a person who's gathered tools, definitely standing on the shoulders of giants, that have completely transformed my life. And one of those tools was therapy, specifically DBT. I have suffered all of my life in ways that just made it so easy to want to unalive myself. And now I only suffer in ways that I either do to myself or they're just parts of life itself. And so I have to radically accept that this form of suffering that occurs is just called life. There's always a default version of suffering the human has to go through, whether it's the mother who has to give birth to her child But that is still worthy suffering. You know, I always in my mind separate worthy suffering from unnecessary suffering because I have unnecessarily suffered a lot of my life. And now I think I'm just grateful for the necessary suffering, sort of the honorable suffering, the wise suffering, the thoughtful suffering, um, because it seems to lead me to joy. It really does. This is a part of that. This is a part of that. There is a lot of necessary suffering in what I do for a living. But it always seems to coincide with my joy. And as long as that continues, it's great. But that's the tool I also gathered in my journey. And I hope to gather so many more tools as I keep going. But I also have the tool of stopping. I have the tool of letting go. I have the tool of saying no thank you to temptation. I have the tool of saying... I'm going to stick with my joy. Now that I know joy, anything else that wants to tempt me away from it seems impossible to me to engage with. I just look at it and I think to myself, I see the temptation. I remember giving in to that temptation in the past. But I couldn't imagine actually doing it now because joy is so much better. It is so much better. And it took me very long to find it. Eight years old, when I fully became aware of all the problems I was about to face in my life, the beginning of me taking on an incredible burden of suffering until I was 30 and I learned to let it go. And then now, of course, I'm in the practice of letting it go. 
which takes us to Tara Bratch, who is sort of a related to modern day Buddhism. She is actually a, a, um, an educated person, right? She has a bachelor's in psychology and political science from Clark University. She was awarded a doctorate in clinical psychology from a uh, fielding graduate university and she herself does yoga she was raised christian she does kind of modern day buddhism if you will and that's what she's known for so i haven't read any of tara's books but of course i know a lot about her work because she her name just comes up with everything but she sort of modernized buddhism in the world which i think is really lovely because sometimes it needs to be digested that way but don't look at her and think she's my teacher and she's the only one i can learn from don't look at Sidguru and think he's the only one i can learn from don't look at anyone and think that's the only person learn from everybody because even the quote bad teachers will teach you how to will teach you how to see bad teachers in the future you know what i'm saying and then remember like for me, I consider myself a lifelong student. If you guys feel like I'm a teacher, great, but I mostly feel like I'm a student giving people the tools I've gathered. I don't actually feel quite like a teacher. I feel more like a, a fellow student and I just wanna exchange information with you sort of in a symbiotic way. You know, um, there's a blog, there's a, a, a skeptics path to enlightenment.org and they have a section on radical acceptance and particularly they talk about repetition, which I think is sort of a, a, a nice digestible way to remember that introspection, living in the present, radical acceptance are all a matter of repetition. So it says radical self-acceptance is not a one-time course you finish and move on from. It is a mindfulness technique that follows you with each new moment. You must unlearn biological conditioning to consistently seek pleasure, go numb, and run from difficult emotions, which sort of contradicts the idea of determinism, but also could move within it. I think we are biological creatures, but I think you can evoke free will by engaging with your introspection and making a decision beyond your biological urges or default settings. Now, of course, you could still make the argument that because we're atoms, we're still biology, or because we're genetics, we're still biology, or because we're sort of evolved over time, we're still biology. And so everything that we do is within our nature, which is why I think everything humans doing do in including creating computers is actually a part of our nature because I think all of these things were created from the tools we found on earth. And I think earth is this living organism and we sort of create from that living organism, the things we see around us. So everything that is around us is actually nature and it just depends on how you view the world. But I do think this particular form of meditative practice, living in the present, radical acceptance is sort of that tool to fight that default urge we're all kind of born with. You know, babies are born and then they have to learn how not to give in to their to their reflexes, to their desires. They have to learn discipline. I do think the meaning crisis, going back to Verveke's concept of what's missing in the, missing in the world, is also something that coincides with discipline. And I think discipline is missing from the world, which is why gym bros are so popular right now. The problem with gym bros is they don't have the learned, um, they're not learned. So they don't have the sort of book knowledge of why discipline is necessary. They they say they're Stoics, they quote some things that they think some Stoics said, but they don't actually have the knowledge behind it. And even if you don't remember it, look, if you're like me, it's very hard to reference what you've read. I've read thousands of books and I'm just the worst person when it comes to remembering what I've read. But you know what I've done? I do think I've internalized all of that information. I think every lecture I heard at church growing up, every lecture I heard in school, every YouTube philosophy podcast I've listened to, every blog that I've read, every book that I've read, I know is internalized somewhere in my subconscious. And I do think that along the way, it has absolutely radically changed my life. So remember that this is a tool of uh, repetition and you need to practice well because you can practice badly. And I think I see that a lot in the world, people practicing very poorly. And so I just want to encourage you to practice well and with intention. And, and I know it sounds almost exhausting because you think, I thought you were going to give me this amazing tool that will solve my answers and I was going to be enlightened and float on a cloud and never have problems again. Girl, if only. Okay. If only, no, but I can guarantee you if you go through the journey that many of us have been through, you will reach a point of joy. You will reach a point of understanding the self, whether you're a two or a five, that will allow you to let go of so many of the burdens that you are unnecessarily carrying. You will stop suffering in ways that have been unnecessary 
though necessary, up until the point you decide to let them go. When you say living in the present, I mean right now. Right the second, right this second, right this second, right this second. It's about letting them go now. When I say they're unnecessary, I don't mean all the times you felt it. I mean the moment you decide not to carry them anymore, they become unnecessary. Life is suffering. It just doesn't have to be the kind of suffering that you're going through right now. Some suffering does end. And then sort of honorable, wise suffering continues throughout life because life itself is suffering. All right, that is my podcast. Thank you so much for being here today. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Please leave your comments in the sections down below. And if you have tools of your own you'd like to share, please do references, favorite books, favorite podcasts. I will link all the information that I read out to you today in the description. I do appreciate Marsha Linehan's contribution to the mental health world, especially since it coincided with philosophy and spirituality. But remember, therapy is not enough. You need therapy and philosophy. It's okay to be religious and spiritual. You just got to find the right tool to lead you to your peace and not the tool that is helpful for learning distraction. There are tools you will gain that will teach you what distraction is and temptation. It's okay to let go of those tools. They were there to teach you a lesson because they are still a tool, but some tools aren't meant to be kept. Some tools are meant to be experienced and let go. So get, you know, become prepared for the idea that you will gain a tool maybe a scammer or a guru in the in the in the money making world convincing you they have the answer if you just pay them $6000 you know that's maybe a tool to teach you a lesson about how people will use authentic uh tools to sort of give you a fake one but the tool itself is still useful cuz then you learn from that mistake but that's my concern for the world obviously is that people are going to mistake sort of the shallow tools for the deep ones. And there are truly profound tools out in the world. All tools are useful tools. All trips are good trips, even bad trips. But that doesn't mean you have to repeat and carry on the suffering and the burden of that suffering forever. Sometimes it's just for the moment that you are having just in that span of time. Life is tiny little moments and some can last a lifetime, but that's up to you. Okay. Okay. I'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye. My head in real life while I'm dead My belly's being fed and I'm okay I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out Was a fool. Dun, 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 dun.